Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Brett Norton with Beyond Clean, and I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to those of you joining us for the first time, and also to those of you returning for yet another Beyond Clean virtual event. Today's webinar is titled Beyond the Steel Door, a journey of steam sterilization excellence. Today, we'll be exploring what really goes on behind the steel door of your department's steam sterilizer. Our steam sterilizer experts are joining forces to build a case for true process optimization for your sterilization workflows. How can your SPD prepare for sterilization excellence from the first load and beyond? We'll find out today. I'd like to thank our event sponsor, Getting F, for helping make this amazing hour of education possible. And if you're here for CE, please make sure to hang on until the end for your CE certificate. If you're joining us live, I'd also like to encourage you to ask questions. We are here to answer any of those questions and help demystify any of those steam sterilization issues that you may be having in your department. What is available in the resource window? Well, we have some sponsor provided web links for additional information. And we'd like to invite you to follow Beyond Clean on LinkedIn and also stay so you can stay up to date on the latest Beyond Clean content and educational events as we have a lot coming this year. All right, so let's get this one rolling. Joining us for this webinar event is Jacob Flores. Jacob is the territory manager at Gettinga. He's a former NFL player who discovered his passion for the medical device industry. He has a strong passion for steroid pr processing education and advocacy and he is dedicated to improving patient safety and quality of care by collaborating with healthcare professionals to optimize workflows, educate staff, and demystify common steam sterilization misconceptions. Carmen Ferrero is an infection control account manager at Gettinga. He is a seasoned professional with 24 years of experience in biotech manufacturing, sterile processing leadership, and infection control consulting. Carmen is passionate about bringing education to the front line of our industry and bringing the front line behind the steel door. All right, so let's get this one rolling. Join me in welcoming Jacob and Carmen. All right. Well, thank you, Brett, for that uh, really warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's mostly that true, but I appreciate it anyway. Um, as Brett said, I'm, I'm Carmen Ferrero. I'm the Northeast uh, Regional Infection Control Territory Rep. Um, been with getting about seven, seven wonderful years, uh, and then some right now, um, a lot of my background combines, um, sterile processing as well as pharmaceutical manufacturing and operations. Um, and yeah, happy to be here. Um, and happy to have this opportunity to present to you guys today. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks for the intro. Uh, we're excited to be with y'all today. Uh, my name is Jacob Flores. I am the territory manager down here in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, and I've been with getting it for two years and my background before, uh, medical sales was, uh, professional football. So, um, I always use the analogy that offensive line, which is what I played. I played a uh, center for the Green Bay Packers, the bills for a little bit and kind of bounced around. But, um, I always say that offensive line very similar to sterile processing because we're the ones that do the dirty work or the ones that do all the protecting and then someone else gets credit. And in football terms, that's usually your quarterback. And then in this setting, it's going to be the doctors and, and, uh, the OR staff. But what I love about sterile processing is this is where it happens. Nothing else happens without us. Right. And so today we're going to take um, everyone through a presentation called Beyond the Steel Door. And you're going to hear a lot of football analogies today. I, I know Carmen's heard a lot of them when we did this. Uh, but it, it's just an easy way for me to relate. So we're going to be talking about some of the fundamentals of what steam sterilization looks like and then how to become excellent at it. So we'll go through a lot of the processes of what that looks like. And one thing I appreciate about Carmen and his background is you were a sterile processing manager, right? Carmen, can you kind of talk about your time doing that for a while? Sure. Um, I kind of got, I'll say, roped into it. Um, in uh, 2000, I believe it was eight, I started in the hospital, and uh, it was one of those things, be careful be careful what you wish for, but uh, 
I jumped in and, and was, was very eager and a lot younger at that time um, to use my operational background in manufacturing and pharmaceuticals to kind of hopefully streamline and standardize a little bit. Uh, a very broken process at the time. Um, I, you know, uh, I had uh, cockroaches in the department. We had mice. We had people eating and drinking at their workstations. I mean, it was when I took over uh, my department at that time, it was a mess. And I can, I can say our mission to clean it up and make it better and, and a higher quality um, process for our patients. And we succeeded at doing that. Um, and, you know, the rest is, is kind of history. I, I got the pleasure to go through a whole department redesign project, uh, implementing a case part system with the operating room. So all those challenges that are associated um, with, with that. Um, and it was a really great experience. It was a very re rewarding experience uh, and uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't change it uh, one bit. Awesome. Well, I know we're gonna expand on some of those opportunities and um, chances to improve workflow as we go through the presentation. Hopefully you can kind of give some examples. I know oh, we talked yeah. from your the, background. The, the, the yeah. great thing about serial processing, Jacob, is, as I think you know, is is it, it is a process, right? So there's so much low hanging fruit, as I like to call it. Um, you know, you can you can easily pick off some things every week, to, so, simply such as looking at your workstations, right? Are they all standardized? Um, can I go to any workstation in an apartment and and have everything I need right there? To you know, despite you know what time I come in or what I'm working on, you know, so, so there's a lot of low hanging fruit. There's a lot of easy things to look at for, for process improvement. And that's kind of why I fell in love with it uh, early on. Yeah. We'll, we'll get yeah. into some of that. Yeah. And speaking of low hanging fruit, I would say education's in that same bucket, right? A lot of, um, companies and organizations offer this for free and it's really just educated. And some of what we're going to go over today is just a reminder. I think it only helps people as new staff comes in, older staff forgets just to be re-educated every year. Um, so I'll just go through what we're going to talk about today. So we'll identify some of the basic building blocks of steam serialization. So like the title suggests, what happens beyond the steel door? How, you know, what happens in the mysterious box when we close the door and, and run the load, okay? And then after we get the basics, we're going to go through and talk about maybe some processes or ways that we can improve once we know what the basics look like, okay? And then we'll wrap up just talking about how we can take some of those processes and insight and maybe uh, use them in our department. So again, the goal of today is to go over the basics, talk about different ideas to optimize, and then how we can take those into our department. So starting off, Carmen, what does it mean to be excellent? I know you probably had this in family life and your work life. What, what does being excellent mean to you? Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, depending on the situation, it can mean something different, right? So when I think about excellence and serial processing, um, I kind of look at it at differently as like more of a moving target. You know, you're never going to achieve perfection in a, in, a, in a process that is constantly changing and evolving. But, um, you know, things like what are, what are, what are the measurables in serial processing? On-time delivery to, cus to the customers, which would be OR and the clinical team. Um, you know, and not only on time, but a high quality sterile product. We want to, we want a sterile end product. So those are things that I would say, um, on a monthly basis, I would look at as my measurables. So if I can achieve that with very little, what we call process defects, and we'll talk about those, I'm sure down the line here, um, then, then I, I feel like you have an excellent process, but you know, you know, you'd never want to get lazy and kind of complacent because it is a process and you know, we're in the healthcare field and we learned from the pandemic, you know, information science really changes by the week in healthcare. So we always want to move that bar and kind of strive. Excell excellence should be moving almost weekly uh, in our departments. Sure. And, you know, they actually, I don't know if they did this on purpose or not, but they put a Vince Lombardi quote down here on the slide, but love it. Um, I love <laughs> it. Yeah. I just with the background in Green Bay, but um, I had a lot of football coaches along the way try to help us strive for excellence. And one of the things that uh, I remember is when people decide you in football, it's easier for you to do that as well. And that always starts with the coach. So hopefully, um, you know, at the highest level, setting a culture of not perfection, as, as you see on the quote, it says it will chase perfection, but, and 
along the way we'll get to excellence, right? So we're not expecting things to be perfect, but when we do get to chase excellence, then you see on the right side what that looks like. It's better patient safety. It's greater efficiency. And then for everyone on the team, it's less workload when everyone's doing their job correctly, right? Yeah, I think I think uh, that's even way more important today. We think about the staff is, uh, the critical staffing issues that we have industry wide. I mean, everywhere I go, I'm sure you would agree, Jacob. But the main problem I hear is, yeah, we, you know, we certainly we need new equipment. But if we don't have people to operate the equipment and people to wrap trays and and and, and help the OR, then that you know that's the major issue is not having enough staff. So we want to work, you know, smarter and not necessarily harder, so that. You know the limited resources we do have can can be spent on the critical tasks. So it's you'll you'll probably hear me say you know work work smarter, not necessarily harder. Uh, you know at least a few times today in this presentation for sure. But, and so how do and so let's get into some of the building blocks. So how do we measure if steam sterilization works? Right. I'm sure everyone remembers the log reduction, or maybe it's been a while since high school math, but each log reduction goes down by ninety percent. So um, the first time we do it, it kills 90% of the bacteria. Well, that leaves us, you know, 10% left. So then the next time we do it, it kills 9%. So now we've killed 99% and so forth and so forth and so forth. Um, and so that's kind of how we measure it. That's the first thing to understand. Any, anything you'd add here? Um, yeah, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the thing to remember about this is that like our spores, our biological integrators that we, indicators that we use, the BI test that we do every day in some places are even doing every load monitoring uh, today, which I think is amazing. And that really should be a gold standard. But if you look at the spores, um, you have a 10 to the sixth concentration of spores. So that's a million spores. So at the end of that, sterilization process we should have that down to that 99.999 percent reduction and that's the, that's the goal and that's why we use um that spore and that that concentration so it, um we're really challenging um the ability of our sterilizers to do what they're supposed to do definitely and so there's four things to remember on how we actually uh get to reduce that number right it's the steam contact it's making sure that all of the air is pulled out of the sterilizer so that steam's contacting every point uh every instrument and that's the temperature that we reach so that would be like the 270 right and then we yep. have the time so the exposure time which it varies by ifus but maybe four minutes three minutes and then the last part of that would be the pressure right and and everyone, I think, understands how pressurized these uh, steam sterilizers are. But those are the four ways that we're actually killing the things on the right side here, which is viruses, bacteria, spores, and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. If you look, uh, I, I, I was fortunate enough to take a microbiology course in college, and I really, I really did like it. And I spent some time working in a tissue culture lab, which was super, super uh, fun and interesting. Um, but... Basically, the way that steam uh, kills these microorganisms is it just denatures the proteins. You know, we're all made of proteins, and within within microbes, they have proteins like that encapsulate. Like the virus has a a capsule on the outside, and then the bacteria has a cell wall, right? So, the steam, the high temperature, the pressure, all that stuff um, destroys, denatures those proteins, and so that's how. Um, sterilization basically works. If you think about like when you drop an, an egg into a hot pan, it's called coagulation, right? The, the, the protein changes. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good example of how sterilization works. For sure. And so let's take a look at what the machines actually look like. So we went from the smallest level and we're getting bigger and bigger. So on your sterilizer, you're going to have four different parts. Everybody, I think, knows the chamber that's the biggest part which we see but some of the other points the thermostatic trap the controls i think we know the drain the gasket um and the door but this is what the back end looks like so if you ever go behind and see hey what are all these uh valves and stuff like that going in i think the one i kind of want to point out is the sediment screen and you're seeing how uh steam is exiting right and so down here if we don't have there's a little sediment screen that catches um maybe tags and other stuff right um if we're not cleaning that out on a constant basis that's kind of the exit for the chamber right 
but we'll start running into problems if we don't um, keep that clean. Absolutely. I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we can both agree when we, when we travel around to our customers, you know, one of the things I always point out is I like to pop, pop one of those screens and just see, you know, whether they're actually, um, giving it any attention or, or, or not. Um, and it, it's easy, it's easy to forget, but I, you know, when I tell customers is, you know, when, when you're doing your, your Bowie Dick test, just, you know, pop it out, take a look. It, it takes literally two seconds. If you get a long pair of sponge forceps, it makes it a lot easier for yourself. You know, the other thing to point out too, uh, Jake, but I think is it, that's very important is the door gasket. Yes. Um, you know, that has to be clean and free of any debris as well. So I usually recommend that they, they kind of wipe that down daily with a, a lint free, something like a lint free cloth, you know, to keep that kind of keep any debris off there because depending on what you have in your steam, it can really gum up those uh, door gaskets as well. And if you don't have a good seal, you know, we talk about a pressurized vessel. Well, you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have pressure. You're not going to have sterilization basically. So Correct. Yeah. That, that gasket helps keep the pressure, um, where it needs to be. And then you can see the pressure gauge, which measures all of that. Right. Yep. So, okay. So that's some of the basics on the fundamentals. And again, the theme of today's presentation is excellence, right? So I think you can see down here when we are excellent at the small thing, it means we don't have to redo things again. And it means, uh, there's reduced dip delivery time to the OR, right? And then we're staying compliant, which is really one of the main goals of sterile processing. Absolutely. I think if you go back to your football days, like how many, how many snaps, right? How many snaps did you take? You know, how many yeah. repetitions do you guys do in practice every week? It's, it's a similar concept, right? How many trays do we wrap? How many, how many, uh, washer loads, how many serializer loads, you know, it, it, in the, in the grand scheme of thing, it can become very redundant because it is a process, but I think we always remember how important and critical this process is to not only the success of our operating room team, but you know, really to the, to the patients, right. To their outcomes, you know, we want to make sure that we're delivering a high quality end product, which is a sterile end product. That's gonna, you know, not, um, it's gonna, it's gonna allow that, that, uh, clinical team to provide that high level of care to the patients and not make them sicker, right? The last thing we want to do is introduce an infection to yep. somebody who's, uh, already ha has some, some issues, some critical issues. Definitely. So, um, let's break down those steps in the sterilization process, right? And to me, I think what I love about this chart is it talks about where the process starts, right? It starts oh, yeah. before decontam. It is a hundred percent point of use. And you know, I've seen it a lot of different ways, but you really want to get the SPD and the OR working Absolutely. together because you cannot get to this end goal unless, um, our friends up in the OR are yep. starting the process. Correct. Oh yes. And, and everywhere we go, you know, it, it, it's tough, right? It's, it's a tough environment that they work in. It's, it's stress, stressful or a lot of pressure. Um, nobody really wants to take ownership of the instruments, but at the end of the day, it should be a shared ownership. The instruments go through many, many hands, um, before they're used on the patients. So it, it needs to be a shared responsibility. And as Jacob said, that pre-treatment at point of use to decontamination step is the single most important step in the whole process. If, if it ain't clean, it ain't sterile, right? Yep. You've all heard that, uh, echoed many times. That's one of the first things that I learned in sterile processing and it makes a lot of sense. You have to get all that gross debris off, um, to, uh, to allow the sterilization process to work. So that pre-treatment step in the operating room is a critical step to allow that decontamination to start and be done effectively. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, if one of these steps is it done, then it turns into one of those charts where we just go back, like, okay, if we catch the assembly, well, then it's got to go back to decontaminate. Absolutely. So if if we're, you have one dirty instrument in a tray, what happens? Everybody, everybody listening out there knows that yeah. if you don't just send that one instrument back, you know, chances are the whole tray is dirty. So you're sending the whole tray back. So whoever was working in decontaminate spent, you know, an hour plus working on that one tray to get it through the process. Well, now you've just done double the work because maybe you took a shortcut or, you know, you didn't open something up properly or it didn't soak long enough. Um, so you're, all, you're only hurting yourself and you're only slowing down the whole process when that happens. So that decontamination step, I cannot underscore, um, really the importance of, of that step. No doubt. Okay. So I know we talked about reducing reworking. And so we've kind of covered that a little bit of how Absolutely. if we're following the process, then we were 
uh, kind of eliminate having to redo steps, right? Um, the second thing that we'll talk about optimizing the process for is making sure that we're loading in a timely manner to match our machine capacity. Because what we want to do is these machines should be running at capacity and we should be putting loads in um, as as quickly, I mean, as efficiently as we can. I think, um, you know, machines that just sit idle, it's kind of, kind of a waste of resources if, if we're being honest, right? And then the last point is just how do we collect data and what data do we collect? So we'll jump into this here, but starting with the rework. I know, Carmen, you just talked about it a little bit, but maybe hit on the hard stops that you've seen that and to help produce the rework. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's quality control 101. It's process 101 here. Um, you know, what I used to preach to my team was, you know, if we catch a mistake, before it leaves our four walls, it's it's not a mistake. It's it's almost probably like picking up a fumble, you know, you guys picking up a fumble, right? And then and then converting a first out or better out of it. It's it's not a mistake. It's 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 a caught mistake. So you want to try to have that mentality because you want to catch that mistake in the four walls. So uh, it, and speaking specifically of sterile processing, what I what I would say is, you know, we had a checklist, like a quality checklist, something like five or six things, you know. Um, are the barcodes present? Uh, is there tape? Um, is there filters? Is there locks in the sterilization containers? Um, all that. And it was it was basically a before and after. So before you load the sterilizer, there's a, a little checklist and then there's an after checklist, right? So if we capture those data points and those simple visual kind of inspection points prior to sterilizing the load and then prior to dispatching to customer, Boom! You're gonna catch you're gonna catch any mistake within your four walls, and then it's not a mistake. It's 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 a nuisance, right? It, it's it's an inconvenience, but it's not like you send non-sterile product down to the operating room and it was used on a patient. So it's yeah. all about quality control and correcting and and catching those mistakes prior to um, them leaving the department. Really, yeah, it's just just doing things right the first time, right? Um, in football terms, like. We go out to practice, and if we didn't have to play right, coach would make us run it again <laughs> and again and again until we got it right. It's the same thing loading a sterilizer. Like if yep. you're putting heavier stuff over lighter stuff, well, we're gonna have to run the load again because the condensate yeah. is probably gonna, yep. you know, be yeah. You know, but what set so. that whole that whole load is 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 then doomed. So now you know we go yep. back to where you don't have the staff that we used to have in in the industry to run sterilizers, and now you're you're rewriting whole entire uh, sterilizer loads. You can't, you just can't have that. You know, the, the hard stops, you know, if you think about the operating room, Jacob, they have yep. what's called a timeout every timeout. single case. So everybody just stops what they're doing and they review a checklist. Um, you know, what's the patient's name? What are, what are we doing? What's the surgery? You know, what side surgery are we doing? And, yep. and that's kind of what you want to implement in sterile processing at certain key uh, points. Specifically, I think about, you know, before you wrap the tray, um, putting that indicator inside the tray um, before you load that sterilizer. Those are some good places to build in these cell. hard yeah. stops for, for quality checks. Yeah, I, l I like the idea of a timeout in sterile processing because yeah. the timeout takes 30 seconds of minute in the OR. And if you do the same thing before you push a load in, um, you can catch some of those mistakes before, hey, we do the whole load and then 70 minutes later, 80 minutes later, we have to redo it again for Absolutely. another 70 or 80 minutes. So those are areas where we're chasing excellence and trying to optimize the process, right? Um, the next point that we're going to talk about is minimizing the idle time of the machines, right? Are we, I think one good point, uh, I'm not sure if everyone has their favorite sterilizer or maybe we just have one sterilizer, but if we do have multiple sterilizers, are we balancing the loads? Are we kind of running them equally or do we kind of have a workhorse that we lean on? Because if we're putting more miles on this one and then this one's not getting as many miles, well, we're probably going to have to replace this one more often, service it more often, right? Absolutely. This is where your data data collection is, is pretty critical, you know, because how do you know? You, you need you need to know how many cycles am I running on each sterilizer? You know, how many how many trays am I loading in each sterilizer? You have to have some, some benchmark baseline data in order to make sure, unless you have automation, like in this picture, but not everyone has automa automation. No, automation doesn't make sense for every department. So you do have to you do have to collect some data, and we'll talk about that down the road here. But um, 
yeah, as Jacob said, you you know, those machines cost X number of dollars and when they're sitting there and not, you know, not cranking, not doing anything, that's 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 not helpful helping anybody. Yeah, I think I think data does run into uh parallel to that one that we're talking about. And one area that you can collect that data is how long does it take your department to load the sterilizer? How often, you know, based on different types of trays, how long does it take to uh, assemble an ortho tray or a minor, you know, major minor set and so forth. And then we can start optimizing um, our assembly team based on, okay, how long does it actually take to run and load a sterilizer, right? Absolutely. And these are just some some ideas for, for what kind of data you should be collecting. Um, you know, you're always going to collect what's called process defects, um, which would be like, you know, number of how many re- sterilizer recalls you've had, number of delays due to missing instruments or waiting for instruments and things like that. So those are kind of the big ones. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, like Jacob said, you know, how many how many sterilizer loads are you running per day per sterilizer? How many trays are you putting in there? Those are the things that are kind of like the building box that you want to assess um, almost daily to see. And, and then, you know, total turnaround time. But, you know, how, what's the time between... I, when I hit start from one cycle to the next cycle, that's, that's kind of important because that's, that's how long something could be sitting in a sterilizer, just waiting or cooling down. Yep. Can it be cooling down in a different area? You know, you're monopolizing that whole sterilizer chamber. So there's, there's many, many uh, factors and, and things and metrics you can look to improve there. Yeah. And then the last thing I would add is when I was in the NFL, they put like, uh, they have these small little trackers, GPS trackers in the back of our jerseys. And they would collect all of this data. They'd figure out how fast are we running? How much, wow. you know, uh, are we are we moving? And then they would adjust our <clears throat> practice load based on that. When I was in Green Bay, Coach McCarthy was the coach. So now he's the, the Cowboys coach. But he would uh, adjust our schedule based on data, right? And so if we take that same concept to sterile processing, um, maybe we're experiencing a lot of delays from equip- equipment being down. Okay, well, now we have the data to show as opposed to saying, oh, man, this is always broken or it's always down. Well, the always is a different conversation than taking the data to, you know, a superior and be like, hey, this is what it's actually costing us. And here's the the data to show that. So that's just end of the coaching point here. Absolutely. And, and then when you do have that data, you're able to see what size sterilizer would we need, right? They make sterilizers from one to two trays all the way up to 36 trays and uh, everywhere in between of that, right? But yes. um, we kind of need to know, or it's important to know, um, how big is too big and then how often does it take to load that sterilizer? Yeah, it used to be, you know, the, the kind of a thought in the industry, um, what I started was always bigger is better. And, and I think as time goes on and with data, you can, you can pretty much prove that that's not always the case. Sometimes it might be depending on your inputs, but in, in most cases, it's probably not, not true. You know, again, it comes, comes down to that. How many times are we pressing start on that sterilizer, the smaller sterilizer, the medium sized sterilizer per day versus that large sterilizer that about takes I got to wait for 24 or 36 trays to fill up, you know, and again, that's data. So, so, you know, we got to look at that and then measure from the and, and see. Yeah. These, these can all be measured. I know we'll jump into line balancing here, which is, I think a challenge that almost every sterile processing department faces is how do we plan our staff and how do we plan, you know, our capacity for, for uh, processing trays based on when the trays are coming down and when the peak time is, right? So on the left here, you'll see um, an example of a department that is measuring how many trays are coming down from the OR, what time they're coming down, and then how many trays we're actually assembling per hour. And that kind of helps us plan, all right, from a staffing perspective, we probably need more people you know, down on decontam when the trays are coming down and then I can bring or plan my team to be on the assembly side when the trays are being assembled. Right. So it just helps us 
uh, schedule better. I'm sure you had this a bunch. Um, oh yeah, it kind of on your to, own, right? And it used to frustrate me. Uh, you know, when I started, I would have, um, you know, like 25 people at 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. kind of sitting around doing nothing because, as you can see, this is a very good um, depiction of, you know, when the actual trays come down. But really, from I would say 10, 11 o'clock, you know, right up through the evening is when. That's the, the busiest time in sterile crossing because the OR cases are wrapping up. So all the trays are coming down from the OR. But at 7 a.m. when we first get there, you know, there's not yeah. much going on. So um, especially now where you're you're lacking the resources, we want to make sure that this is on point. And this is a very easy thing to do. You don't need instrument tracking. It certainly helps to have that. Um, but, you know, you can do that this very manually, very easily by just recording the number of trays at each hour it, it interval. And I can most, most of the departments have adjusted their workflow now from what I can see yep. um, and their staffing to address this because they have to. They don't have any choice, you know, yep. so it's kind of where we're at. But it just makes a lot of sense if you haven't done this. And so um, based on there. this, you can plan, OK, I need this many assembly yep. tables. Maybe I only have two assembly tables, maybe we figure out a way to add a third or a fourth one or maybe just like you can see on this blue line going across we can only sterilize 20 trays per hour well maybe next time when it comes time to upgrade our sterilizer we think about getting a larger one and a smaller one or vice versa right so yeah those that's are just a great ways to actually use the data from line battle to it's a great point so uh, again, we're leading right into it, but capacity planning, like how big of a car do you need to buy? Understanding your volume um, based on the data that we've been collecting, right? Yep. So Pretty straightforward there. Uh, any any thoughts there, Carmen? I know we kind of touched Not on really. it a little I think, bit. I think, I think we hit that on the, on the head with the last slide. You know, it's just that if, I, if I'm a family of six and I have a Honda Civic, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It's not going right. to work. I'm not going to be able to take everybody to soccer practice, you know. Yeah. So I, I would need a mini, minivan. So if you, have, if you have three operating rooms, do you need a sterilizer that can sterilize 15, 20, 25 trays? The answer is probably not. Oh, yeah. So the gap. That's uh. Yeah. That's right. probably too much. So. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of simple, right? Yeah. And then just some conversations that are going on all around the theme of excellence is learning from others. I know when I was a rookie in the NFL, I, I looked up to some of the older guys and saw, hey, what are they doing well at? What is challenging for them? Right. What What are they learning that's new and constantly pushing yep. themselves? I remember Aaron Rodgers was our quarterback and he just got um, got moved over to a different team now. But one thing that he did really well was he would always focus on two things every day and they were different every day. Every day. So one day it might be handoffs and the next day it might be screens or pass pro, but he would focus on two things uh, to help push himself and make him better every single day, right? So if we take that same concept to sterile processing, it can kind of get monotonous at times, but how are we pushing ourselves to be a better tech or manager or supervisor? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I Uh, think, um, you know, one of the things I'll add is that, you know, as we travel around to customers, we all are doing basically the same thing. We all have the same challenges. We're all trying to be the best that we can be. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel and, and at us as reps, I think this is where we can be very valuable. You know, we have the advantage of traveling around to all these different customer sites. I mean, we're going to Nashville next week for HSBA, which is, which is great opportunity and network with people from across the country. And we can bring those best practices that, you know, what, what, you know, Hey Jacob, what did you see in Austin? You know, Hey, they're doing this and, and they're using this product or whatever it is, or, or you know that we we can really uh help improve your process just by observing and and, and sharing information with, with what we've seen works yep. and and what we see more importantly what we see that doesn't doesn't work right and yeah sometimes you learn from the plays that didn't work or the things yep. that didn't work uh, but sometimes it's helpful to see people doing things right and so i think the world now is more connected than ever and so we have to get out of our little bubble sometimes and I know as reps, we go from the department to department. I cover Oklahoma and most of Texas. And so I see a lot of things. And one of my favorite parts of the job is just seeing what's successful, seeing what's challenging, yep. and then taking that to other departments. And so 
uh, reps are one way to do that from from uh, other companies as well. But just on your own building uh, your network via LinkedIn or via you know Facebook groups are a good way. Yeah, the Facebook local group, the local chapter. We used to have a chapter, chapter here that I that I belong to. That was a great way to share information. Um, you know, yeah. and really kind of extend expand your outreach and. So speaking of going around, one of the things that we see almost everywhere is staff, staffing shortages. And that's just like almost every single account we go into. It's a challenge. So that's one of the questions I I lead with is how are you guys addressing this How and trying to make it better, you know, for everyone. Yeah, I would love to hear uh, hear some of that because again, we're we're asked all the time, you know, if, and and we see that that's the major issue. And the only thing that comes to my mind is, you know, again, it's, it sounds cliche, and I've said it a couple times already in this presentation, but you know, you have to work smarter and not necessarily harder because you have to you have less resources, so those resources have to be allocated to critical points of the process every day, um, and you know, the day. You know, one day you could be fully staffed and the next day you might have six people not there, you know, and that's that's a good number of detriment to the department. So your workflow changes quite a bit that day, you know, so you have to you have to adapt kind of um, around those uh, around those changes, I guess, you know, definitely. And uh, down there, the first bullet point is leverage your equipment or get them the right equipment. And nowadays they are doing um, automation on a lot of sterilizers and washers. So is that something that works for every facility? Absolutely not. Does it work for some facilities? It does, right? So it's just being educated and, and looking at those when the opportunity does present itself. So. Absolutely. And then the second part of it is since there is a lot of burnout, a lot of times you're getting new techs and that's where hopefully we, um, you know, education is really important it, whether it's from one of your reps whether it's through uh your hospital through online i think sometimes one thing that i've seen is you can hear something like five different ways and it might uh-huh. click the sixth time right uh i'm sure if anyone has kids they can relate like you probably tell your kids the same thing over and over and over and then grandma says something and it's like they listen to it or they said it in a different way so I think that's the only thing I would really emphasize about about training is maybe just different voices that are all saying the right thing. Yeah, I think it, you know, and and back to my manager, uh, SBD manager hat um, days. Training is is critical. You know, the departments that are fortunate enough to have um, like a clinical educator that is in charge of training, I, I think, are, are very lucky because it really uh, needs to be managed that way and and. If you, if you don't put, you know, it's all about selecting your mentors the right way. Um, and if you, if you don't identify who those key people are in the department that, that, you know, cause not, not everybody, uh, can teach or train it's, and not everybody wants to, some people just want to come in do their job, punch, punch in, punch out and leave, yep. which is fine. But you need, you need good mentors. You need to identify them early on and they need to be engaged with, with, um, you know, the trainees and they, and the, I think I can't overemphasize enough that that bullet point of explaining the why if you're working a serial process and you haven't asked why we do this or why we do that uh, on almost a weekly basis for sure yeah. um you know i would encourage you to do that you got to understand why we're why we're why we're running this sterilizer cycle for instance why why are why are we running a four minute cycle versus a six minute versus eight minute cycle you need to understand and you need to have that intimate knowledge of the process because that's going to lessen the amount of, of mistakes or errors and defects in your process. I agree. And I think that's one thing like these presentations are good for is learning the basics, learning maybe where there's some key gaps where we can understand um, how to improve the learning from others, right? Um, so this is just a continuation of that is um, once you've trained them, showing that they're able to demonstrate that ability. So now... Yeah. Um, in football Top terms, we would watch the film. We would understand, okay, we're running the play this way and you're blocking this guy. Well, now we'd actually have to go do it. So it would be like, yeah. all right, let's go in the field. We did the teaching, so now let's run through it. So that's that's kind of how I see this. You, you understand, you teach, and then you have to uh, go out and, and actually do it in, in real life. 
yeah, that competency piece is so huge at Sarah Preston because it is a hands-on, it's like, you know, like your, your football days, you know, it's very hands-on. You have to, you have to demonstrate that you not only understand from a conceptual standpoint, conceptual standpoint, what are we doing, but I got to show, I got to be, I got to show that I'm competent in, in this. So, and this is where, again, I think us as vendors uh, can help you guys. You know, I, I do a lot of department competencies. I get a lot of requests to do that. We have we have documentation for competencies on all of our equipment that we can help you with, um, and we're happy to do that. You know, I, I learn a lot when doing that myself. I learn a lot from from you guys, and again, it's about sharing best practices um, and making sure that you're comfortable when you have new people. You know, the worst thing that you could do is have a new person that's not confident or comfortable. You know, running a sterilizer. Um, running a washer or even the worst in decontam by themselves at the sink, not really understanding what they're doing. You know, those are critical process points. So you have to have comp not only confident, but competent people um, in, in those in those areas. Yeah. And again, the whole theme is we're trying to pursue excellence, right? So we're given a lot of resources, a lot of different ideas. Maybe some of them work, maybe some of them don't. But I think one thing that's cool about this format is we don't have to be there in person. We typically do these or have done them in person, but now you can turn this on or share it with a new tech because it's logged online and you can go back and revisit it and uh, Absolutely. and review it and say, hey, here's here's one on sterilizers and what it actually looks like behind, you know, the science and the process improvements and stuff like that. Okay, so... Um, here we are at beyond the basics so we've kind of gone over a little bit of the basics and what it looks like um anything you would add anything that jumps out from this slide Herman? yeah no i think it's this just goes back to my point of of you want to have competent mentors you know it's kind of a train the trainer thing you know i, I used to call our sterilizer person whoever was operating the sterilizer kind of the captain of the ship <laughs> for obvious reasons because they have one of the critical jobs for that day for the department, and they're supposed to be aware of, you know, they're, they're kind of the lifeblood of that OR. They know what's needed at what time, what's coming down, when. So they're, you know, they, if you only have a certain, think about it, you have two sterilizers, every sterilizer load is, is tri becomes critical, right? Everything you put in that sterilizer becomes critical, especially if it's needed uh, for, for a patient that same day. So that's that sterilizer person, that super user uh, becomes even more critical. So you want to have those people in your department. You want to have them operating, you know, you know, manning, manning, being the captain of the ship, manning the sterilizers. You know, I, I had a decontamination coordinator specialist that he uh, he was awesome. He ran he ran the whole decontam, everything decontam. He was responsible for the training, um, the equipment. Um, you know, if, if something if we had a process defect back there, that went back to him. So. You have to have those key super users in every critical area of your department, and that's going to be um, critical to your success. Yeah, for sure. And then I guess just shifting to sustainability as we go forward, I think everyone knows that um, there is a lot of water, a lot of electricity, a lot of steam used in um, sterile processing. And there's ways now just to think about reducing that, uh, especially because I know hospitals are becoming more uh, critical of how much they're using, right? So um, it's just something to, to start thinking about when you get the chance or it's another thing that you can measure with data and go to your set goals for yourself or your department. Hey, we used to spend this much water and then we had a renovation and we were really conscious of it and now we spend this much water, electricity and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's about just being a responsible uh, steward of the environment, right? Like we we make equipment that is very um, utility uh, heavy. I mean, it, the sterilizers use a lot of, of utilities, washers use a lot of utilities. So, you know, how can we minimize that impact? Um, you know, from both a cost operational standpoint as well as an environmental standpoint. And I think if you look at um, the, the newest equipment in the industry, we, we all do a very good job of making that, um, kind of first and foremost, reducing that in negative impacts uh, on the environment and on, on hospital utility bills as well. Yeah. And in one way, I know we talked about blowing a vacuum, um, on sterilizers, but one way to reduce the water that you use is to use chilled water. So that's 
yep. something that's coming up in the industry. Um, and that's one way to think about being more sustainable and saving water in the future. Absolutely. Um, the other thing to think about with when it comes to equipment and excellence in equipment is does this work for my staff? Is it adjustable? Do we have maybe some heavier loads being pulled in and out automatically, right? Um, is it easy to push? Like think you, you kind of want to plan it based on um, the person in your department. You don't want to plan it based on the strongest person, right? You want to plan it for for everyone in the department. So if something, if you do get a big sterilizer, okay, how hard is it to push that um, that load into the rack, right? Then that goes back to the bigger, is an all better conversation. Absolutely. We're not all NFL football players working in <laughs> sterile processing, Jacob, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been back to my SPD days and, and I had a lot of small, small people, you know, and, and they, and so we do, it's a great point. We want to cater to, to those people to make them, again, I, you guys are sick of me saying this, but work, work smarter, not harder, you know, making sure the equipment kind of lends to that so that people aren't getting hurt. Um, you know, there's not repetitive work injuries and whatnot, and you're not, you're not even, you're not missing even more people out of your department to, to, to make the part, the department work. So ergonomics is, should be, uh, first and foremost in every, um, design feature of, of yeah. equipment. Yep. And then we touched on automation already, but that's a trend in the industry that's becoming pretty popular. It doesn't work for everyone. In some cases that it, it makes sense, like, uh, with, again, some of these loads are pretty heavy. And so it, if you do have the space, it might be something to explore. Absolutely. Okay. So just conclude in here, we, um, kind of went over the excellence and what excellence is. I think you have to define terms first, right? Um, and then how steam works, right? And based on that, we got to processes and ways to improve and then some new trends that might be coming out and how those all kind of tie together. Any, anything we missed here, Carmen? No, I think um, I think we covered we, we covered the basics and then some pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, this, this is a good wrap up, you know, steam sterilization yeah. is never going to go away. It's, it's always going to be here. It's been here a hundred years. It'll be here, uh, you know, a few hundred more at least. Right. So it, we have to embrace it, which we have. And, and, you know, always uh, like that, like our first slide, we're always chasing excellence. We're never going to, going to hit perfection, but we're, as long as we keep chasing excellence, then that's, that's where we want to be. That's where we want to live. Um, I loved your analogy about, you know, Aaron Rodgers. She picks picks two small things every day to, hey, can I improve here? Can I try to be excellent in these two things? You know, keep keep your yeah. sight small. It doesn't have to be, you know, oh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna revamp the whole department from from top yeah. down. No, pick pick something small. Like I used the analogy of the workstations in the beginning or your your you know, what the way a uh, case cart goes through Geek and Tan, you know, simple, yeah. simple little steps that can have a, a huge um, process output for, for your, for your team and make things, make things easier for them. Yeah. I, I think one way that, uh, I had a coach say at one time is 1% better. So we're not yeah. trying to improve, you know, we're not going to win the Super Bowl this practice, but we're going to get 1% better today. And whenever that 1% looks like in your department, whether it's adding the hard stops that, uh, Carmen talked about or, maybe thinking about size into the right sterilizer or 1% better might be getting better um, ergonomics for, for your staff. Maybe you do have a smaller staff, right? And so hopefully uh, there was some value in today's presentation. We always enjoy uh, talking about steam sterilization. We live in and breathe it every day. Um, and now I just always like to conclude with thank you to everyone in the industry. Um, this is the front line. Surgery does not happen with without this team and the people on this call. So I know Absolutely. I've been on the operator room table and I'm sure everyone has loved ones or themselves that has been too. So it's something that doesn't get heard a lot in this industry, but uh, we appreciate y'all striving to get better and strive for excellence. And, and we're right along with y'all. So if there's anything we can help with in the future, Carmen and I are both on LinkedIn. Uh, so feel free to, to, um, Follow us and, and shoot us a message. And hopefully, you, uh, hope you will get to see. Uh, hopefully, we we'll get to see some people in, in Nashville next week. That would be there great. There we go. Yeah, looking forward to that. We'll, we will be there. All right. Nice job.